Welcome back to another episode of Back to the Futures, the official podcast of the Futures League presented by 78 Sports. I'm Owen Shadrick alongside Matt Ferreira. Matt, we had a lot of Futures Leaguers going into the postseason. We only got one left, though, and it's Jeremy Pena on those Houston Astros, who honestly may be eliminated by the time this episode comes out. But still, another year with a Futures Leaguer in the American League Championship Series is pretty cool. Yeah, we saw four coming in, and it was fun to watch them all do their thing in the postseason. But we still get to watch Mr. Pena put on a show. So hopefully he continues to do that all the way into the World Series. Yeah, we will see what happens with the Astros and Rangers series. We're recording this here on Tuesday night, so we don't know. But we also want to thank everybody who came out and supported our Adam Keenan golf tournament. It was a, a extreme success once again this year. Um, thank you to everybody who was involved. It was a beautiful day for golf. Um, Matt, I don't think you hit it that well. Can't say I did. Yeah, no, you didn't. And neither did I. So <laughs> back to the futures Canada golf club. That's the moral of the story here. Well, today we mentioned guys that played in the postseason in the futures league. We imagine that the man that we had on the podcast today will be one of those very, very soon. Matt Shaw of the now Chicago Cubs. He was drafted 13th overall. He's the highest draft pick in futures league history at 13 overall last year to the Chicago Cubs. He joins us along with his Worcester Braveheart manager, Alex Dion. Matt, this is a really special interview. It is. You get to see his perspective throughout going through the Futures League, the Cape Cod League, the minor leagues now, and even Maryland in the Big Ten, and all of the success he's had and what has led up to it. Yeah, he had an incredible stint with the Futures League that started at the beginning of August and ended in mid-August, and it was one of the best stretches we've ever seen. We will get into more of that on this episode, but we want to get you there. Here is Matt Shaw and Alex Dion. We are honored to be welcomed by two special guests here for episode two of season eight of Back to the Futures. He was a former Worcester Braveheart and is now with the Cubs organization. It's Matt Shaw and his former coach with the Bravehearts, Alex Dion. Gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. How are we doing today? Good. Thanks for having us. Yeah, great. Great. And Matt, we will start it off with you. And we got to start at the obvious. You were drafted 13th overall this summer by the Chicago Cubs, which was the highest draft pick in Futures League history. What did it mean to hear your name called and have a, officially have a path toward the majors? Yeah, um, obviously a really special moment for me, my family, my girlfriend, um, a lot of people who were there. And, um, you know, something that obviously needs to happen if you eventually want to get – you know, you're calling to the major league. So, you know, being able to get drafted, have that opportunity and, you know, kind of looking forward now to saying, you know, finally for the first time in my life, you know, you're you're closer to the major leagues than you ever been before. So it's it's really cool. And the scouts can talk, the media can talk all they want, but the person that's gonna know you most is your coach. Alex, you coached Matt during his stint in Worcester in twenty twenty. What did he show you on the field that made you believe he could be this high of a draft pick? Well, I mean, it was, it's in the whole story is really interesting. And I, like, I was happy Maddie agreed to to do this because um, he didn't spend a ton of time in Worcester. Um, we were really, really fortunate to get him um, late in the summer in, in 2020. Um, our, our GM, Dave Peterson went and saw him. Uh, I think the Sturbridge Legion coach, Jim Rosile at the time, like texted Dave was like, Hey, we got this kid. Um, that's pretty good. You should take a look at him. Um, you know, so we added Matt, like at the beginning of, of August, like kind of right, right when we're getting ready to make a playoff push. And, um, he spent like the, the remainder of that summer with us, like two weeks or so. And then we we're fortunate enough to get him back the following summer, like again, right at the end for, for a couple of games. So, but he didn't spend like a ton of time in the organization. He certainly made a huge impact um, on it. I mean, there's, there's still guys, obviously like it was incredible to, to see him get drafted this summer. And, you know, the guys that I had this summer, even in the clubhouse are like asking about him and like what type of player he is and um, like what type of person he was, what, what was it like when he was here? Like, and there was a lot of special moments in a really, really short amount of time. So I think while, you know, he wasn't a guy that played, you know, like 50 games in a season or, or whatever it was, like the time that he spent in Worcester, he made a, a huge impact. 
Yeah, Matt, that impact, it was unbelievable. It was the beginning of August. You came here to get reps, and it was one of the craziest weeks we've ever seen in the Futures League. You hit 341, eight home runs, two doubles, knocked in 11 runs, and then proceeded to go six for 13 in the championship series to top it all off. What was it like to come in and to deliver for that team in such a short amount of time? Yeah, um, you know, obviously really special for me, you know, being able to come in and and play good baseball. Uh, Kind of my first taste at college baseball, you know, up to that point. I was about to head off to Maryland in a few weeks after I played in the Futures League. So, you know, for me, it was great because I just want to get that experience to be able to play against great competition. You know, we're playing against Sal Frelick and, and Cody Morissette, you know, in one of our games and a lot of other really, really talented players. Ben Rice being one of them on our team, that that is uh, someone I looked up to at the time um, and I still do. But, you know, being able to be around those guys, understand the professional life, um, you know, understand college life and stuff like that was really um a great experience and then you know being able to be successful everybody wants to be successful so you know being able to be successful is awesome uh being able to hit some home runs is awesome but um you know overall it was it was more of a learning experience to be there and and be with these guys and I'm I'm watching you know 15 20 scouts come to our games and they're and they're you know ready to pick Ben Rice and Sal Frelick and Cody Morrison and guys like that so you know being able to to look at those guys and and see kind of what you want for your own future and compare yourself to those guys and see all the work that goes into being in that position and you know being able to play with them and and be in the same field as them and experience that you know it's something that that you look forward to something that you really want to do so and you talked about guys that were on your team and on other teams that you looked up to and the success you had. But in your short time in the Futures League, what were your impressions? Uh, You know, my impressions in a short time was that that was the year COVID hit, so there was a lot of really talented players there, um, all in, like, the Futures League, which I had never heard of before. So it's like all these real talented players just kind of get thrown into this local league. And um, my impression is like, you know, I didn't even realize that league was going on. Like, how are all these guys like in my backyard without me knowing? And and um, so, you know, it was just cool to be there, you know, and, and you know, good to experience the last couple of weeks. And we made a little playoff run, um, you know, so being able to just kind of be in that environment is really cool. And what did Alex teach you in your time in the Futures League? Yeah, Alex was a great coach. You know, I think me and him got along from the beginning. Um, you know, I think we we were able to develop a friendship kind of as the years went on. And, you know, he taught me that, you know, there's more to coaching than, you know, necessarily kind of the raw, raw and, and kind of the pushing guys in one direction or the other. But being able to let guys be themselves, being able to let guys kind of go out there take what they need to do and be able to perform at a higher level. And I think that was a really professional environment um, that you don't get a lot of places. I mean, we're talking, you know, there's young kids in summer ball, you know, I'm, I'm still in high school. You also have, you know, college coaches that do a very similar thing where they're very, very pushy. They're very pigeonhole. You know, they want someone to be a a certain way. Um, So being able to have that freedom, but also, you know, that leadership to, take that freedom, but also keep people in line, keep people in the right direction. Um, you know, I think that's something that is a very professional way to handle things. And, you know, I think it shows, you know, obviously the Bravehearts has had a lot of success over the years. And, um, you know, to me, that's exactly what you want to coach is someone who's going to kind of allow you to get better instead of necessarily kind of pushing you to get better. Because if you're there, you obviously want to play good baseball. You're obviously driven, you know, you're motivated. So you don't necessarily need someone to be in your, in your uh, ear kind of motivating you all day. You need someone that's going to be able to kind of show you the direction that you want to go in. Yeah, that's great. And Alex flipping it to you. What was the biggest thing you wanted to see out of Matt during his short tenure in Worcester? Um, Well, well, first of all, like as, as Matt's touched on a couple of times, like the league was so good that year. And, and we had, um, you know, Alex Amalfi, uh, who signed with the Blue Jays, Angela Baez, who's pitching professionally still, Ben Rice, um, like Matt mentioned. So, like, it was a really good team, and I was fortunate to have a lot of those guys for for two and, in some cases, like three summers because a lot of them weren't coming back um, that summer. And then once the Cape shut down, the NECBL shut down, it was like everyone's scrambling 
at the at the last minute to like put their rosters together and we ended up putting together a, a really good team so like having the older guys on that team i think allowed me and the coaching staff to kind of create that environment that that matt just talked about so a lot of that has to do with with the veteran players that um were on the team but like my i think i've told this story before but like one of the first interactions i had with matt was i think his first day um with us we were I think we we're going to Brockton. They were doing like some pro days that summer where it was like split up with um, like each team had a separate day. So we were going to Brockton and he sat with me on the bus uh, for a little bit of the ride down, like, like a lot of players um, would do on their first day. And I was just kind of like, Hey, I don't know. I don't know what, um, I don't know how much I can really play you over the next few weeks, but like, regardless of it, this is going to be a really good experience for you. Like you're going to be in the clubhouse, be with some older guys, like some veteran players, like, soak it all in but like can't promise you anything on the field and and obviously matt being who he is he's like yep got it like that's cool and um like went out and and he had a like really good round of bp i think we played him um the next day at new britain and then the following day in a doubleheader in westfield and he had hit a home run at westfield um and then sort of like just went on a run where it was like the expectation i think that's when we started leading him off too after that double header the, it was like the expectation was almost that like hey matt's gonna lead off he's he's gonna go deep at least once tonight and this 18 <laughs> year old is gonna like carry us the rest of the way through um the championship series so like obviously once he stepped on the field and you know you could see all the tools and i think one of the most impressive things especially at that age was like how mature he was and and how he approached the game um how hard he played the game and then how much fun it looked like he was having like all the time when he was on the field. Yeah. And that was definitely what I got from that clubhouse that year was a veteran presence and guys who were having a ton of fun. And you talk about expectation for Matt leading off. It wasn't leading off. He wouldn't have hit a home run a game. It was going to, he was going to lead off the game with a home run at one point. He went on a, what, I remember a stretch there where it was like, Oh, there's another one. Oh, there's another one. <laughs> I think when I asked him, I, I, I remember having a conversation. And I was like, what's what's your two-strike approach? And he was like, just swing harder. <laughs> yeah, that might have changed a little bit. The last yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it was 2020. You know, we're, we've come a long way since then. Yeah, yeah, we've come a long way. And Definitely. you both have touched on it. Um, Alex naming the players on your team. And Matt, you touched on South Ray, like Cody Morissette, guys that – you know, are, are in the major or in the minor leagues and South Raleigh specifically, who was called up and playing in the playoffs batting fifth for the Brewers this year, you played against him and all those guys in 2020. What was that experience like kind of getting the all-star of all-star leagues together in 2020 when, when COVID had everybody else kind of scrambling? Yeah. I mean, like I said, it's exactly what you, you know, you want as a competitor is to be against all the best players, you know, see them all, kind of in their element, doing their thing, you know, seeing how they deal with the pressure of the scouts, seeing, you know, what they're doing at the plate. You know, there's there's so much to the game that you can get from just watching it, um, you know. So for me, being able to watch, talk to Ben Rice, to experience, you know, kind of everything within those two weeks was, you know, it was really, uh, I think it was really perfect for, what I needed as a player to mature and move on to the college level and, and beyond. Yeah. And again, I mentioned it watching Sal in the <clears throat> watching Sal in the playoffs. That was unbelievable for all of us. You, you kind of just touched on it, but I think uh, we'll get a direct answer here. Does it give you optimism for your career, seeing what you can do in the show based on seeing what Sal is doing, what Ben did last, what Ben Rice has done last year, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, yes, I, I think something I talk about a lot, you know, guys like Sal, but going even further, you know, guys like um, the angel shortstop uh, and then um, Shanuel from Nolan and then a few other guys who are moving up quick, you know, and to see them move up and to be successful, not only gives me optimism, but it gives, you know, me kind of hope that, you know, decision makers are more optimistic about moving young guys up quicker, trusting that they're ready to play in the big leagues, 
trusting that giving them that experience is worth it. Um, and I think it kind of goes back to, to Alex and, and, um, you know, them giving me a chance to go play in the futures league, you know, at, at the time, I'm sure there was a lot of question marks, you know, you don't know me, I don't know them. Um, and then, you know, things kind of work out because, you know, putting that trust in the people to come in and, and be successful and, and kind of being in their corner. Um, and I think it's showing in the big leagues that that's starting to kind of become a little bit more normal. You know, you didn't see that five, 10 years ago, you know, it was kind of two to three years was like quick. And, and now it's like, you know, Shanuel's moved up in, in a month or so. Um, and, and, and I'm not saying that, you know, there's, there's plenty of guys that, you know, like myself included, that you need to be able to experience some minor league baseball to to understand what it's like and to move forward. Um, but it is really cool to see guys moved up quickly and to see their success. So, you know, to see Sal be successful um, up in the big leagues is, is awesome. You know, you, you want to see every prospect go up and be great because then they're like, okay, you know, this is working. Let's bring up the next prospects and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, he's setting a pathway for us and hopefully we can set pathways for more guys, um, more younger guys and and kind of just continue the, the circle of baseball life. Hold on. We'll get right back to back to the futures. But first, we want to share a message from our friends at 78 Sports. Do you have kids playing baseball or softball? We all know practice time is limited, especially here in New England, not to mention the cost of lessons and cage time can add up very quickly. Save yourself time and money by giving your kids what they need to work on their game at home. Our friends at 78 Sports can help you put together the perfect at-home training setup. Whether you want to start small with just a tee and a net, or looking to set up a full cage with turf and a pitching machine, they have you covered. And I've used their stuff before. I've seen their facilities. They definitely cover everything. The team at 78 Sports design and install hundreds of at-home and commercial sports training facilities. So let them help you find the perfect setup for your space. Visit the 78 Sports website at 78sports.com. That's S-E-V-E-N-T-Y, the number eight, sports.com. For a limited time only, by just mentioning Back to the Futures, you'll receive a 10% discount off your order. That's S-E-V-E-N-T-Y, number eight, sports.com. Now, back to your regularly scheduled programming. And you talked about guys in your draft class and of draft classes before moving up quicker and quicker. You were promoted to double A this year yourself. How did it feel to continue to move up into the ranks? Yeah, I mean, it's great. That's what you look forward to, you know, being a competitor. You want to move up. You want to play well. Um, and it doesn't always happen like that. You know, as much as guys want to play well and want to be great, you know, baseball is one of those games where you're going to fail a lot of the time. And it's just going to happen, you know. I was fortunate enough to have a really good, you know, month and a half. Um, but it's not always going to look like that. You know, it's not always, you can't hit three fifty for forever. You know, I mean, I guess you can come close, but, but not really, you know, so being able to understand that there's always going to be ups and downs and, and to not take that for granted, you know, like this was a great couple months and, and I'm sure that there's going to be times where I struggle too, but, you know, kind of taking the best out of whatever you got and, um, you know, whatever it may be, I'm looking forward to next year and, and I'm looking forward to just, you know, playing baseball. And, and like you guys talked about how much fun that veteran, that veteran group had at the Futures is because, you know, not everyone there was was hitting 500, you know, but everyone understood that it was a privilege to be on the field, that being out there with each other was a blast. And, and we had a lot of fun. And, and that's what made us good is that we were there, we wanted to be there and we wanted to really just enjoy the day and I think everyone did that and I think that's why you know we made a championship run we lost but you know at the end of the day people will look back and be like that was a, a special summer I'm sure for other guys not just me to look back and be like wow I miss a lot of those guys you know we had a lot of really really good guys with a lot of experience and it was a lot of fun yeah certainly a summer to remember for a lot of teams but especially in Worcester um, question for both of you straight up no strings what do you believe Matt Shaw brings to the Cubs organization? Matt, we'll start with you. I'm going to answer that. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know exactly how to answer that. You know, I, I love playing the game. Um, you know, I put put my work in in, in baseball, and, and hopefully I can bring a championship in the future. So I'll leave it at that. A humble response. Um, I mean, obviously, the organization made a huge investment in the kids, so they obviously think highly of them, um, taking them in the first round. But 
I mean, they're getting a, a really, really talented baseball player that can do a lot of special things on the field, and they're getting an even better person. So I believe that his work ethic and his ability and his, his love and passion for the game is going to take him far. And Alex, you just touched upon how the Cubs think highly of him drafting him so high. But MLB.com also thinks highly of you being the Cubs' number six prospect and number 96 prospect in the entire league. What pressure comes with those rankings, if any? Um, I don't think there's really any pressure in it. You know, I'm sure that, you know, different guys take it in different ways. And I'm sure that, you know, depending on your your environment, your response, that there can be pressure in those scenarios. But, you know, for me, it's just so exciting, you know, seeing that, being able to be here, being able to really just appreciate everything that's going on. Um, you know, I, I was with uh, Matt Swope, the Maryland head coach, a couple of days ago, and he talked about a little bit about perspective and being able to have perspective. And for me, that's huge, you know, understanding that, you know, as much as there might be pressure, on those scenarios, being able to realize how lucky I am and how much fun this is to be, you know, doing this, um, you know, as much as, as much as I'm enjoying the moment, you know, these careers, 10, 15 years, it's not a long time, you know, guys are in their careers at 35, but that's not really that old, you know? So being able to really just enjoy kind of the ride that, that I've been going on and, and understanding, you know, really just, how lucky, you know, we are to be in the, the situation, you know, I'm sure that you guys feel the same way in, in your careers and, and how you feel just really lucky to, to be able to, you know, enjoy all this. And, and yeah. And after you get drafted, one can only imagine your phone is blowing up with texts and thank yous and congratulations. We got a special text from Cubs shortstop Dan V. Swanson welcoming you, welcoming you to the organization. What was that feeling like to see his name pop up on your phone? Yeah, that was really cool. I mean, the whole day was a bit of a whirlwind. Um, but Dansby texted me and I didn't see it till a little later. So I ended up shooting him a call to just say hello and introduce myself. And, you know, I, I didn't know a ton about Dansby before that. I mean, you watch him play, but you never really know someone, you know, but I think it showed a little bit of about his character and and why obviously the Cubs made a big investment in him is, you know, they believed in him as a person, as a leader, as someone who's going to do those things, you know, the little things, reaching out to people, showing you care, you know, being a good teammate. Um, and that's not always on the forefront of people's minds. Um, you know, I'm sure that they, I'm sure being in the big leagues, you have your own set of pressures that you're dealing with um, probably much greater than what I'm dealing with now. And so, you know, being able to, take a step back and, and show that a little bit of respect for me is something that goes a long way. And I have to ask, you were drafted 13th overall to the Cubs. The Boston Red Sox had the 14th pick. Being a Mass native, did any part of you hope to slide to number 14? Honestly, no. Um, I love Chicago. Um, I was sick of wearing the color red. I was ready to move on from that. And, uh, but, but overall I was just, you know, either pick would have been great. Um, I don't think there was one or the other. I wanted more, but being able to, what I know about Chicago and their fan base and Wrigley, um, very historical, like the Red Sox, but I think there was something about Chicago that it just seemed right. It seemed like a good fit. It seemed like where I wanted to be. And, um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it any other way. So. I mean, they got deep dish pizza out there. It was <laughs> tough to beat that. They asked me about that, and I said I don't like deep dish pizza, and they didn't oh. like that answer. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, you maybe you can come back to New England and have pizza out here, whatever. Yeah, I'll take my thin crust pizza all day. Exactly. So I think uh, Alex may have touched on it earlier, but what was the process, Matt, from your perspective, ending up on the Bravehearts uh, late in late twenty twenty? Yeah, I'm playing Legion Ball, um, which in our, our local Legion Ball is is pretty crappy Legion Ball. You know, um, you're playing on crappy fields. You know, it's COVID, so a lot of the baseball is shut down, and, and that's why I end up playing Legion Ball. Um, so it's kind of just something to keep you going, keep you doing something. You know, it, we had a great time. I had great teammates, um, but it's not great baseball. 
Um, so, you know, for me, it was like, um, our coach was, was like, Hey, I know the Bravehearts owner and maybe they could use you over there. And I was like, okay. Yeah. I mean, it, I, it didn't really come from me. I would have, obviously, I, I didn't know that that was an opportunity that I could do, but it worked out really great. He, he offered the opportunity and I was like, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd love to do that, you know, cause I wanted to be playing, uh, really, really competitive baseball. Um, so, you know, like Alex said, we, we go over to Brockton, we do that little showcase and then I play the next day and, um, you know, I don't think I did very well, but, but just being there and having the opportunity to be there, like you said, being around those guys, um, you know, cause I'm, I'm looking forward to being in college pretty soon. So, you know, having that experience before college, it gave me a little bit of maturity that I think I needed going into my, to my freshman year. Yeah. And then, I mean, it's really unfortunate that you, you didn't get to play every day. Like Alex said, there was just no way that you were, you were getting on that field. Prove me wrong pretty quick. <laughs> I think one of the, the interesting things for, from, from where I sit, like, obviously I feel super fortunate to be able to like meet and manage so many baseball players from all over the country. And like the majority of them do not end up where Matt is right now. Right. Like every, every kid's dream is to play in the big leagues and you get drafted in the first round and, and win a world series or, or whatever it might be. Um, like the large majority of them don't do that. And, um, you know, any kid that was coming in that situation, I would have that same conversation too. And I think it's just, um, like one of the luxuries of doing what I get to do and, and be involved in so many different players lives and, like I said, division one, two, three kids from Florida, Texas, Massachusetts, wherever it is like, and every summer something special happens. Some player does something really unique. And, and certainly in 2020, like Matt was the, like, that was the coolest thing at the end of the FCBL season to see him go out and perform the way that, that he did. Um, but yeah, it was a, I mean, the whole summer was really cool. Like seeing Sal and Cody and, and all the other guys, Mariano was on our team at the beginning of the year before he got hurt. Like a lot of really, really good baseball players. Hey Matt, you've played in a few summer ball leagues. We've seen you obviously in the futures, but you also played in PG CBL and the Cape Cod league where you'd be named MVP and win the championship in the same season. How do you feel summer ball affected your growth as a player? Yeah. Summer ball was like the pro ball of college you know you get to go and you play every day um you know you travel around a little bit um so you know i i love that because i i knew what i was looking forward to in professional baseball was that that was going to be a little bit of your life you're going to be playing every day you're going to be traveling a little bit um you know so for me it was like okay i can kind of get a taste of what professional baseball will be like in college and you know i really look forward to summer ball every year um i look forward to to playing against really good competition. I look forward to wood bats um, because I thought that evened out the competition. Um, so I look forward to all those things that summer ball brought. Um, and so, you know, every year going into whatever summer ball was, Futures League, the PG, I'm not, I'm not even sure anymore, or the Cape Cod League, um, you know, I, I look forward to to all those summers. And what's your advice to those who are thinking about playing summer ball? Um, I mean, there's plenty of kids that do not have a choice. There are college coaches saying you're playing summer ball. Um, so I'm not sure how many of those kids really have a decision. Um, but you know, I'm sure that people have their own, have their own values, have their, what they value in their life. And, you know, there's plenty of guys that don't want to play summer ball. They're not necessarily looking forward to playing professional baseball, you know, and, and that's fine. You know, if that's not who you are, then, then I totally understand not playing summer ball. Um, but for those guys that are looking forward to playing professional baseball in the future, um, you know, being able to go play summer ball and experience kind of all those things I just said between the wood bats, the competition, the pro ball lifestyle, if you really want to do it, you know, if you're really into it, you'll probably see summer ball as more of like a, a great opportunity of what professional baseball looks like. And if that's the way you look at it, then you go into summer ball saying, wow, like, this is great. I love this lifestyle. I love playing every day. I love having all these opportunities. Um, and if you go into it and you hate it, then it, you know, 
professional baseball might not be for you. And that's okay. You know, it might be like, wow, you know, that's too much, you know, it's just, that's not who I am. And, and I want to be put my interests elsewhere. And if that's the case and that's the case, but I think either way, it's good to go there and learn who you really are, figure out, you know, what you're all about, what you really want. And I think summer ball can do that really quickly uh, for some players. Before we return to Back to the Futures, we want to share a message from our friends at Zorian Back Company. Rob Zorian started the company, Zorian Back Company, in 2003, literally out of the trunk of his car in Davie, Florida. Within two years, he was selling his wood bat line to Major League Baseball and continues to manufacture the highest grade wood bats for Little League all the way up to the majors. Rob Zorian, founder and president of Zorian, says, I started the company in 2003 to service all baseball players in the United States and beyond. And after 19 years, our mission has not changed. We are very excited to have the opportunity to work with the Futures League and wish all of our players and coaches a healthy and successful season ahead. For more information about Zorian, visit their website, zorianbats.com. Zorian, America's baseball brand. Now, back to Back to the Futures. So Alex, the original question Matt asked is actually a pretty good one for you as well. What do you believe the biggest advantages to playing summer ball are, especially as a coach who's, you said, coached hundreds of players who have come come through your team? Yeah, I mean, I think he touched on a lot of it. Um, it certainly is not for everyone. Um, and like like he said, there's I mean, there's cer- certain college programs that are like really, really pushing their guys to go um, play summer ball in, in certain leagues and have a lot of great relationships with coaches in the summer. There's other schools that really put it on the players to figure that out. A lot of that is really dependent on Division One, Two, or Three. Um But I think it's a super unique opportunity um, for, you know, if you take the incoming freshman, which Matt was when he played here um, the first time, I always think that that player is like a little less deer in the headlights when they step on campus that first fall. So it's like a really good opportunity for them to to be around the college game, be around older guys like we've touched on already and sort of ease their nerves a little bit and give them an understanding of the speed of the game and and kind of the rigors of playing uh, at that level. Obviously, the the um, the college player that has aspirations to play professionally, it's it's a fantastic opportunity for them to get to learn and um, grow as a player, understand how their body responds. Like playing five or six times uh, a week compared to playing like you know a midweek and then maybe three on on the weekend. Um, and for, you know, for, for everyone else, again, if, if it's something you really want to do, um, there's a lot of guys that will come play in the futures league that, you know, aren't playing in front of 2,500 people a night, um, during their spring seasons, right? Like there's, there's a lot of guys that are playing in front of like, you know, 30, 40 people, uh, at their games in, in the, uh, springtime. And so to come here and play, um, in a league like us and other leagues, obviously across the country that, that draw fans and, and, you know, prioritize entertainment along with, with baseball. I think, um, you know, it's a, it's a pretty unique experience for a lot of those players that, that they might not otherwise get. Yeah. Certainly unique experiences when you the general manager is dancing in the eighth inning with a plaid jacket on. Um, but yeah, that's that's the Futures League. And Matt, we talked about your stint in the Futures League and how incredible it was. And this pretty much the same thing happened with your bat. It did not cool down when you stepped on the field at Maryland. You hit 320 for your career, 47 doubles, and 53 home runs, which made you the Maryland all-time home run king. How did you feel going into a, a program and a conference as profound as Maryland and as the Big Ten Conference and immediately making an impact on your team? Yeah, uh, something that... I always had a lot of belief that um, I could do uh, something that I really wanted to do. Something that I chose my college because of was, you know, I wanted to go somewhere where I could have the opportunity to earn my spot in the field and be in a great conference, be in a great team. Um, And, you know, it all worked out great. And I just kind of was lucky enough in my experience to have met someone like Matt Swope, who, you know, I have to mention him because he's probably one of the best hitting coaches in college and maybe even comparing him to the professional level to um, someone who's growing really fast. But, you know, I think um, it all worked out how it was supposed to. And, and you know, Maryland just kind of showed up and 
and they liked me and I liked them. And, you know, before I know it, I was committed to them, but uh, being able to go there and, and play right away is obviously what you want as a freshman, um, good or bad. You want to get that experience. You want to play three years, four years, five years, whatever it may be, but you want to be out there playing to learn, to grow, to, to figure out who you are, to figure out how to get better. Um, the one pet peeve I have with some people going to really, really big colleges with, you know, they're committing 10 shortstops in every single, in every single recruiting class. It's like, you know, don't you want to have the, a better opportunity to play somewhere? Um, and I'm not saying I'm, you know, one of those shortstop is going to play, you know, if they're recruiting 10, one of them is going to play, but you know, being able to understand yourself at the same time, being able to understand who you are, have the awareness to say, you know, this is where my game is at and this is where I want it to be, you know, and, and, you know, that awareness is kind of going away a little bit, you know, looking at kind of the next generation of baseball players, you know, with social media, the way it is, you know, it's kind of too bad to see, you know, some kids are a little bit caught up in that. Um, but overall, like, you know, being able to have that awareness myself and say, Maryland is somewhere where I can earn an opportunity to be on the field and then being able to experience the three years, it, it worked out great. We spoke about your power a little bit, the 53 home runs and being Maryland's all time home run King. We saw you should do something that most players never accomplish in their career. When you hit a 507 foot grand slam against at the time, a number 22 ranked Iowa to give your team the lead. We saw when you hit it that you knew right off the bat it was gone. But did you realize how far it was going to go? <laughs> no, I didn't realize how far I was going to go. Um, but, you know, you just – there's some home runs, you hit them, and you just kind of know that was all you got. You know, you hit it perfectly. You hit it in a good good angle going upwards. And, you know, I didn't know how far I hit it at the time. But, you know, just being in that big moment in that game – and hitting a home run, I think it did a little bat flip or a little like kind of shuffle, which I completely kind of blacked out. Like I, I don't remember doing that. Um, but uh, you know, obviously those are the moments you want to be in, and those are the the times in the games that you know there's just so much. You know, your adrenaline's high, the pressure's up, and 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 that's you know that's what that's what you want. You know, so. And we've seen your power throughout every league you've played in. But you also continue to show off how well-rounded of a player you were in college, going 37 for 46 on stolen bases in your collegiate career. How important do you think those extra 90 feet are? Yeah, I mean, those are huge. And you're seeing now in the major leagues with the bigger bases, you know, how important those stealing bases really are. Um, so, you know, for me, being at a smaller park in college, guys are going to hit more home runs. As a team, we didn't steal very much because you get on first, you got good power hitters behind you. You really don't have to get the extra 90 feet. But, you know, getting into the minor leagues, professional baseball, the major leagues, you know, there's plenty of home runs. But, you know, those extra 90 feet go a long way because some of these pitchers are absolutely elite, you know. So, you know, even in summer ball, too, being able to get the extra base, be at second where, you know, kind of something off the end of the bat might score you. You know, they're realizing now as you see more people stealing how how important and and how valuable that can be. So, you know, stealing bases is something that I have a, a really strong passion for, um, probably more than hitting home runs. You know, you you want to because there's an art to stealing, you know, a home run can be a bit of an accident. Sometimes you're trying to hit a line drive, you hit a home run. But stealing base is a little bit of an art, too. And and so um, it's it's very important, but it's you know, it's a lot of fun, too. So. And one thing that the game is changing about the stolen base is the size of the bases. Are you excited to that? Are you looking forward to that? Do you agree with the rule change? Yeah. So we have the bigger bases in the minor leagues too. Um, so it's awesome. I mean, it, it's, it does give you like that little bit of an edge going to second on like bang, bang plays. Um, so it's great. I mean, as an offensive player, as someone who likes to steal bags, making it easier to steal bags. I mean, it's really all you can ask for. I mean, I'm sure if a power hitter, they, they move the the fence in, no one would be complaining, you know, as a hitter. Um, so as someone who likes to steal bases, I think it's awesome. I think it's good for the game. Stealing is something that's been lost a little bit, but being able to watch guys swipe bags now all the time. I mean, you go to a game, you're, you're almost sure to see at least one or two stolen bases. Whereas two years ago, 
you would almost never see a stolen base. So it makes the game faster, more fun, more exciting. Um, so I, I like it a lot. And in doing my research, you said something earlier that also pointed me to this. You said you can't hit 350 forever. But your most impressive stat to me is that in futures, any summer ball league, Maryland, even in the minors, your OPS has stayed above four digits and you've hit in your career 337. So Hmm. pretty much hitting 350 forever. How do you keep adjusting to the higher competition and continue to excel immediately? Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is is being willing to fail and practice, being willing to, you know, I hit off the machine all the time being willing to crank the machine up to a hundred and go move up 20 feet and get absolutely fisted off 110 on the machine and then going out and facing, facing 96 and saying, okay, this isn't, this isn't all that bad, you know? So for me, it's, you know, being able to fail consistently, being able to understand that that's what it takes to, to grow and to be good. Um, and then being consistent, you know, just in your routines and how much sleep you're getting and what you're eating and, and all that stuff. So, you know, every day you go to the ballpark, you're kind of the same person. You're, you're very consistent in what you bring to the, to the plate and to the table there. So, you know, for me, staying consistent and, and understanding that making practice harder can make the game a lot easier using those team, those things to my, to my benefit have helped a lot. And Alex, did you see that in his routine? Can you can you uh, confirm that? Well, he certainly worked really hard. We were at Doyle Field. I don't even know if we had a batting cage there. So, um, <laughs> but I mean, Matt's like he he touched on his college coach um, and the impact that he had on him, and I'm sure he could talk about that for for the entire night. But um, he's also obviously taken that and like part of his maturity is like becoming his own best coach along the way right so like he's obviously been able to you know to pick a lot of guys brains and whether it's other players or the coaches that he's had but like you know it 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 doesn't do you a whole lot of good if you can't then go take that and translate it to your game and what you're doing on the field so uh, again just kind of speaks to his maturity and and his willingness to grow and develop and, and keep learning and and getting better yeah and he certainly got better through the different ranks that he experienced and going all the way back getting to maryland was no easy task for you we uh, again through our research we found an article from the athletic that said northeastern was the only other program that showed real serious interest but getting that call from maryland what was your reaction when your when your coach that you mentioned called and said you're going to be playing college ball in the big 10 yeah uh it was it was awesome you know obviously that's something you know that i wanted to do um you know i remember they had offered me and it took me like two months to finally commit. Um, no particular reason. I kind of had that feeling that Maryland was the right fit. I just kind of took my time with it. I didn't want to rush into any decisions and I ended up committing on Christmas day just for fun. I mean, a little odd, but, um, you know, overall, you know, when I first committed, it was really, really exciting to be like, okay, you know, the, the recruiting process, the college process, like that three years of anxiety of, of what, all of the emotions that come along with, you know, where the heck am I going to play college baseball? You know, being able to kind of settle that and say, okay, this is where I'm going. I'm a turd. You know, this is where I'm going to play. You know, obviously it's a, it's a stepping stone that, that feels really good as a young kid to be, be like, okay, you know, I figured this out. This is where my career is going to take me. And that's really exciting. Yeah, it's great that you found a home in Maryland. And but that's a great Christmas gift for the entire program. Yeah. And a couple more questions here before we sign off. To start, obviously you grew up and played baseball in Massachusetts. You're now in Arizona. But what was your favorite part about growing up and playing baseball in Massachusetts? Mm, favorite part? Um not sure I have a ton of favorite parts of playing baseball in Massachusetts as a younger kid, other than you know, really, I was, I was lucky because when I grew up and I played Nakona baseball, which is a local AAU team. Um, number one, I had a really great coach, Mike Lyons, who's someone I'm still close with now. And number two, we had like four or five kids that ended up playing Division One baseball. Um, so being in Northeast, you really you're not going to have that very often. Um, so being able to meet those kids, 
Jay Driver from Harvard, Wyatt Scotty um, from Northeastern, and and a few other kids. Peter Mazervi from Harvard too. Um, being able to get to know those kids in a in a pretty generally not a great baseball. You know, the Northeast is cold. You know, people. It's not a really a great baseball um area in the country but you know i think being able to see like these kids are also committed to this these kids want to be professional baseball players i think for me it was awesome to be around kids like that and to see you know a lot of kids that frankly at that age you know when i was younger were more much better than me at baseball um so i think it gave me motivation it gave me more drive and it gave me some perspective on like okay this is what it looks like to be to be a great baseball player and i got some work to do <laughs> Matt, one last question for you. Well, I think I know what it is. We ask everybody, what is your all-time favorite baseball memory? Well, if you know what it is, that'd be great because I'm really not sure what my all-time favorite baseball memory is. Um, my all-time favorite baseball memory. Um, I'll tell you when I was the most in awe ever on a baseball field was when Nick LaRusso hit a walk-off home run uh, against Nebraska at uh, the Big Ten tournament. And it was just, it was a one-to-one game. And there's some games where no one's hitting and no one could buy a hit. So like, you know, you're just like at the plate, you're like, you need to get something going and it's like impossible. So to see him break through off a really good reliever and hit a bomb at a park that's really hard to hit a home run off, I was like, I mean, you just a lot of emotions that go into that moment. Um, but my favorite baseball moment. Yeah, I'm not sure. What what were you going to say for my favorite baseball moment? <laughs> I was fully expecting the draft. Oh, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, because I was thinking like on the field. But yeah, off the field. Yeah, that was probably one of my favorite baseball moments for sure. Alex, what about you? You got a favorite one before we sign off? I don't know if mine's happened yet uh winning the 2019 championship series was really fun um like the basically the same group of guys that maddie got to play with in 2020 uh that won it in 19. i would say the ultimate memory to create would be to win a high school championship i think it's super special like high school baseball is different than anything else so i think being able to win something with a group of kids that you've grown up with that would be top of the list I like that manifesting a baseball memory. I don't think we've ever had that. That's a first. Got about 30 more years to try. <laughs> well, Matt and Alex, this has been a very special episode. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Best of luck to both of you with everything. And we'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks guys. All right. Thanks guys. Well, we want to thank Matt Shaw and Alex Dion so much for coming on our show. It was incredible. It was an honor for us to be able to talk to them and Matt, you know, Alex brought us that interview, brought Matt Shaw to our doorstep. So we thank him uh, especially. And it was great to see both of them sitting together, reuniting like that on the podcast. Yeah, it was fun to chit chat with them and pick their brains a little bit about just baseball in general. Yeah. And as we said in the interview, Matt Shaw already at double A, we assume he'll be in the majors very soon. He's incredible talent. And, uh, you know, it was great to hear from both of them. But that will conclude Season 8, Episode 2 of Back to the Futures, the official podcast of the Futures League. We have new episodes coming out every Monday. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see everyone soon. Peace.